So today's session, Embedding CED in the Social Solidarity Economy in the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, is brought to you by the Canadian Community Economic Development Network. We're a national network of several hundred community organizations and individuals working to create local economic opportunities that support an inclusive and sustainable economy. Here you can see some of our members' logos. If you like the session today, consider joining us by becoming a member or signing up for our free e-newsletters. This webinar is part of a series. Past sessions include topics such as youth employment, social return on investment, the resilience imperative, social impact bonds, and others. All of these past sessions are on our website. And the session is also made possible with the support of Unitera, one of uh, Canada's biggest international volunteer cooperation programs that helps reduce poverty and inequalities in 12 countries across Africa, Latin, Latin America, and Asia. Unitera supports organizations in developing countries that work to improve living conditions in their communities. If you want to find out more about Unitera and volunteering unit opportunities, visit the link you see there, unitera.ca. So today's webinar is divided into two parts. There you have, a, you can put an image to the voice. That's me, Mike Toy, your host today. Uh, I'll get things underway and we'll start off with presentations from Shannon Condorne and uh, Daniel Tichel. And the presentations will last about 30 minutes. And then in the second part, we'll, I'll ask them the questions that you've posted in the chat box. Once again, you should feel free to post your questions, comments, and any other information you'd like to share in the chat box at any time. But before we go to the presentations, let's just get a sense of who we have on the webinar today with two quick polls of participants. You should see two polls pop up on your screen. Uh, the first one asking, what is your interest in the session? You can check any of those boxes depending on what your interest is. And the other is uh, inquiring as to whether you've been involved in uh, activities and reports for uh, Rio Plus 20, the United Nations Conference on Sustainable Development. Let's see how connected you are to what's been going on so far. Um, while people are filling out the polls, let me just uh, give you a brief uh, introduction for the session. Uh, one of the main outcomes of the United Nations Conference on Sustainable Development held in Rio uh, in June, almost two years ago, June 2012, was the agreement by member states to develop a set of sustainable development goals that address all three dimensions of sustainable development and which would be integrated into the UN development agenda beyond 2015. The scope of these goals, like the Millennium Development Goals that preceded them, is ambitious and far-reaching. They should have a significant impact on development programs worldwide, so it's an, an important opportunity to strengthen them by incorporating effective practices for sustainable development that are well known in the community economic development and social solidarity economy movements. So we're very happy to have Shannon with us today to talk about the process and prospects for the UN post-2015 development agenda, and Danielle to share the latest information uh, on the Intercontinental Network for the Social Solidarity Economy's efforts to secure a greater role for the SSE in uh, the post-2015 UN development agenda. So before I turn things over to Shannon, let's just have a look at the poll results. A good mix of interest in the session. It looks like uh, most people are interested in getting involved to influence the UN sustainability goals, so that's terrific. I think that's where we'll uh, much of the discussion will land. Uh, a few people involved in international policy already and programming, uh, people working to, a few more people working to support the CED and social economy globally, and uh, some interest in the North South Institute and REPAS, which uh, Danielle and Shannon will be able to share. And a little less than half people have been involved in the United Nations Conference on Sustainable Development, so a few people who are less familiar. Terrific. Um, so let's get into the presentations. Thanks for those. I'm very happy to introduce Shannon Kindorne. Shannon leads the North-South Institute's work on development cooperation and is a researcher with their Governance for Equi Equitable Growth program, focusing on governance of the aid architecture, aid effectiveness, and aid for the private sector, aid and the private sector. Uh, hopefully the private sector doesn't need too much aid. 
Prior to joining NSI, uh, Ms. Condorne worked on human rights, governance, and trade and development at uh, what used to be the Canadian International Development Agency, um, CETA. So thank you for joining us, Shannon. Thank you for having me. Can everyone hear me okay? I think we can, we can hear you. It sounds like okay. yeah, there are a few people answering. I will pick up the phone and that will be a little bit easier for everyone, I'm sure. Um, so thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this webinar and, um, and, and what I'll try to do today is perhaps give a, quite a bit of an overview um, on the uh, sort of the history or, or context um, for post, uh, what I've called post-2015 sustainable development goals um, and I'll explain why in just a second uh, rather than just calling them the sustainable development goals. Um, but uh, I'll give a bit on the context of the history. Um, I'll then talk a bit about uh, the, the process um, that's happening internationally, who some of the actors are, uh, some of the, what I would say are kind of the trending issues or the things people are getting a bit excited about. Um, and then I'll talk a bit about the priorities and goals and final, finally a, a bit more on sort of opportunities for engagement, um, both within Canada but also uh, internationally. Sounds great. So the, the post-2015 Sustainable Development Goals actually emerged from a, a long history, eh? Yes. Um, you know, we, we have a history actually of, uh, of sort of uh, two, world, two worlds that have diverged that are now coming back together. So, you know, you had a series of conferences, um, you know, throughout the sort of 70s until now that really kind of focused on um, sort of sustainable development where, you know, it was defined as meeting the needs of the present without compensating uh, the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And this was by the Brundtland Commission um, in 1972. And so following that commission you, um, and, and sort of this, uh, this push for sustainable development, you had a number of high-level political commitments that were made to sustainable development, um, and there was a lot of optimism around this in the 90s. Um, or, or sorry, the 80s and 90s, but what we actually saw was a separation of sort of the communities that focused on sort of more the environmental side um, and those who focused more on development. So rather than seeing a, a strong integration of economic, social, and environmental pillars that characterize the sustainable development agenda, we actually see um, that agenda being more influential in the environmental circles rather than the development circles. And rather what we have is um, much more of a focus on poverty reduction and economic considerations. Um, and of course this was uh, later embodied by the Millennium Declaration in 2000, which was of course incredibly um, influential in terms of the Millennium Development Goals that resulted. It was incredibly influential um, in the development circles. Um, and, and we see that sort of taking the center stage, at least uh, in terms of um, influencing priorities for developing countries, but also the priorities of um, uh, providers of official development assistance. And while, of course, the MDGs did include MDG 7, uh, that was devoted to environmental sustainability, I think there's, there's quite wide recognition that really the MDGs were, uh, had a, a very strong focus more on the sort of the poverty and social services such as uh, education and health. Um, and of course, that their focus was largely on the developing world rather than on um, rather than sort of on all countries and what all countries need to do in order to uh, achieve sustainable development. And then, of course, now flashing forward, we have Rio Plus 20. We have uh, a commitment being made to uh, to develop sustainable development goals, um, and uh, I we we also have. Um, discussions looking at while well, the Millennium Development Goals are, are ending in 2015, so what will come next? So you see in the next slide, I've you know, essentially articulated some of the two, pro the two processes, the parallel tracks that are, are going on now looking at how we're going to define the goals that come after the Millennium Development Goals and also how Sustainable Development Goals are going to be decided on as a result of the Rio Plus 20 conference. Um, Perhaps just to I'll flash forward one slide and then maybe keep uh, and then kind of explain this one a bit more. But this is this slide here um, is 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 one that essentially tries to kind of unpack um, the various processes that are going on um, around post 2015 and the Sustainable Development Goals. So I mean, it's not you can't read it perfectly. Um, it's more just to give an idea of sort of the the multitude of actors that are engaging in this process and UN processes that are that are happening right now. 
so you know, I sort of conceptually separate them into two categories, one being the Sustainable Development Goals category and the other being sort of the post-2015, the what happens after MDGs category. And you know, there is strong recognition that these, ca that these need to come together, that, that really these, these, these processes, these debates um, need to come together so that we can have sort of only one agenda um, going forward for post-2015 that will be embodied by the Sustainable Development Goals. So essentially what we're looking at is sort of there's the, in these two broad work streams is on the sort of sustainable development goal side, you have the open working group on sustainable development, um, which met uh, sort of as a result of the Rio Plus 20 process. Um, it's an intergovernmental committee that has been charged with coming up with sort of options and advice for the sustainable development goals that will then be negotiated by the UN member states. Um, and they, they had meetings all last year, um, and, uh, and into this year they're, they're continuing meetings, and this group has essentially um, released on their website, they have listed some 19 sort of thematic goal areas that they're going to consider and look at going forward. Um, and and that, that information is all available on the website. I think we have the links, um, the links were on the, um, the webinar page. Um, so, so, so that's sort of the one group. Then you also have the Expert Committee on Sustainable Development Financing, which is charged with looking at how to finance the Sustainable Development Goals. And so finally, um, the Secretary General uh, Ban Ki-moon set up a Sustainable Development Solutions Network, which is headed by Jeffrey Sachs. And the idea there was to inject research and analysis on sustainable development into the process. And so that group has actually produced a report where they've suggested what the sustainable development goals might look like. That came out last year in June. And they are now actually um, just finishing up a consultation on 100 indicators that they have suggested could be used um, to, to assess progress on, post, uh, on the, the sustainable development goals. So that's sort of the, you know, the one side of it. The other side is this question of sort of the, the MDG folks, the development folks, the post-2015 uh, folks. And really on that side, the UN has launched a major global consultation, which included, uh, has included country level, regional, and thematic consultations in areas such as governance and human rights, uh, employment, inclusive growth, environment, and so on. And this has really been a massive, massive undertaking. Um, you know, uh, with pri the, the idea of sort of identifying what the priorities are of citizens all over the world for sort of that future development agenda or sustainable development agenda. Um, so, so that's sort of the one side of it. The other is, of course, the Secretary General of the UN also put together a high-level panel of eminent persons on post-2015, uh, which produced a report in May 2013, where they too outlined essentially um, you know, what could be a potential agenda going forward on post-2015. They had, I think, 10, uh, I think it was 10 goal areas that they had suggested. And that report also has been quite influential um, in the debate and in terms of sort of suggesting um, what the goals might be for the post-2015 agenda. So you know, you have these two processes. Uh, they're clearly connected. Um, clearly, at the end of the day, we're going to have an, uh, a, a, an agreement that is negotiated between governments. Um, but but uh, but there are also separate parallel processes that are happening. So um, you know the main takeaway there, I think, is just to recognize that this whole process internationally is quite complex. That there are a number of different um, um, tracks, but that at the end of the day, the consensus is there that these tracks all need to come together to have one agenda um, for post 2015 and for sustainable development goals. And so that some of the key, you're going to talk a bit about some of the key people in uh, uh, through those processes, I guess? Yeah, well, I wanted, I mean, I've, I've kind of given a bit of background on sort of the UN side, who those key people are, but I wanted to unpack a bit um, sort of the other actors, <laughs> I guess you could say, um, in this process. And so, so that's what this slide, uh, the next slide is really about, is sort of, um, you know, one of the major critiques in the Millennium Development Goals was that it was sort of a top-down approach. Uh, it wasn't sufficiently consultative. Um, you know, and, and really, the, I think the UN has undertaken massive efforts to kind of um, ensure that this process is inclusive and that there are opportunities for engagement and that the voices of a number of different communities are being heard. And you know, so so on one hand, what you have happening is um, a process where there is really significant room, I think, within the discussions for all kinds of actors to participate and to provide input. 
And so there you see, you know, uh, the UN Global Compact, for example, uh, representing sort of the voice of the private sector has suggested what their, um, what their uh, priority kind of goals might be. Um, you know, the high-level panel report talked about how, you know, questions about ensuring that national uh, or subnational local governments are engaged in this process, that civil society has a role to play, and so on. And there really has been, I think, a much broader inclusion um, of, of stakeholders in the process itself. But I think, importantly, or something to kind of keep in mind that where, where we're going with post-2015 uh, Sustainable Development Goals is really a beyond uh, what I say MDG 8, Millennium Development Goal 8 approach, which was really about what the North needed to do to enable developing countries to, to develop. So it was around trade issues, uh, debt relief, technology transfer, and so on. And really, uh, I think we're looking at, uh, you know, there's a lot of discussion of what I would call almost an MDG 8 plus approach, where really we're moving beyond that intergovernmental focus, uh, moving beyond sort of that north-south paradigm, um, and really looking at a partnership that's inclusive, bringing together um, all, a number of actors that, that impact development. So, the, you know, people talk about parliamentarians and municipal governments, provincial governments, civil society. Uh, South-South cooperation providers and so on. So, so really, um, you know, there's there's talk of sort of ensuring that there's space for various actors to participate in some kind of inclusive global partnership um, to implement this agenda going forward. Um, so, so, you know, not only are actors having an opportunity to engage in terms of defining the agenda, but also I think there's going to be significant space in terms of um, engagement to actually implement the agenda and to achieve goals. So, uh, trending, yeah, oh, sorry, go ahead. Do you have a sense of what some of the themes are that are emerging from the consultations and the processes to date? Yes, I do. Um, I'll, I'll jump to that slide, actually, and then I'll go back to maybe some of my trending issues. So, mm -hmm. I mean, this slide here is basically, it's actually a picture from a, a tool that the North South Institute uh, has developed which is essentially has aggregated all the different proposals that have come out on post sort of 2015 and sustainable development goals. And we have sort of them thematically categorized all of the different suggested targets and indicators and goals that various civil society, um, United Nations, and other actors or think tanks and so on are coming up with and putting forward as, you know, suggested frameworks going forward. And what we've done is uh, we've actually categorized, like the size of the circle actually indicates the number of proposed targets and indicators that we identified being in that area, and by far environment targets and indicators and uh, you know, uh, priorities related to the environment is easily one of the largest categories uh, that we found within our, 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 um, our analysis. But also you'd certainly see the sort of unfinished MDG agenda, the questions around health and education, for example, um, certainly taking, um, uh, gaining a lot of traction as being important areas to also be included. So, I mean, really when you're looking at the priorities and the goals going forward, I think we're looking at an agenda that is going to definitely respond to that sort of unfinished um, millennium development goal agenda that included things like health and gender equality and education, but it's also going to be broader. Um, so you definitely see a lot of talk, a lot of excitement around inclusive growth and employment around finding ways to sort of very, uh, in a targeted way, address inequality. You also see governance and human rights gaining traction, um, although interestingly enough, when the list of the 19 priority areas came out from the um, Open Working Group um, for sort of key issues related to sustainable development, they framed it actually around sort of effective institutions and peace and security, rather than a governance human rights framing. Um, which, I mean, if people are interested, I'd be happy to talk a bit more about the politics around that um, in the discussion session. But I, I personally thought that was interesting that I don't see human rights itself as sort of an actual area that they're um, considering um, or framing, at least in that way. Um, so, so definitely, I guess, the, sort of your key takeaway from here is really that we're looking at a broader agenda, but we're also looking at sort of um, goals and targets on the unfinished agenda, um, but certainly a much, much greater emphasis on environmental aspects, I would suggest. Um, going forward, and I think you know one of the major challenges here. I'm sorry, Michael. Did you want to jump in? 
No, no, go ahead. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think one of the major challenges here is actually between sort of the, the uh, norm setting role that these international agreements can play in sort of identifying areas that are priorities for us all on the one hand, but on the other hand, this question of measuring progress. And I'll just jump back to the other slide because right. that kind of relates uh, specifically to, to the question of the data revolution. But, you know, um, we know that the data that's available on even just the Millennium Development Goals, indicators around poverty and health outcomes and so on, we know that that data is spotty. And now we're looking at an agenda that is going to be broader and more complex. And so the question is being raised, well, how are we going to measure this? How are we going to know if we've achieved what we wanted to achieve, if the goals have been met, progress is being made? Um, and so on the one hand, there's just the methodological question of how do you actually measure human rights, the realization of human rights. Now, if I was speaking to people at um, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, they'd say, actually, we've got a methodology and a framework to do that. Um, but it's political. And, um, you know, convincing governments about, you know, to sign on to that, I think, is, is, is a challenge. Um, for sure. So I think there's definitely this, this trade-off or this, this norm setting versus measurement question that's being raised in that context. And so related to that, you had coming out of the high-level panel report on post-2015 a call for a data revolution. And really what they were saying is that, you know, we need better and more information data to inform policymaking, to inform programming, to measure the new goals, and to, I think importantly, close that accountability loop, enable people to have the information that they need to hold their governments to account. And this idea has taken off. I mean, just if you type in data revolution into the Google, your Google uh, search engine or whichever engine you use, you'll see tons of documents and blogs and, and people talking about this. It's, um, you know, and, and in a way, it's um, regardless of what happens with the sort of sustainable development goal uh, agenda, I think there's definitely a recognition that at the end of the day, you know, building statistical capacity in developing countries, improving how we use information, um, improving accountability through making, by making information more accessible is important in its own right. And so I think, you know, we're going to, this is not an, a, a trending issue that will go away. I think there's a lot of attention on this. It, it you know, aligns nicely with donors' obsession with accountability and results. Um, but also, I think has the you know has that potential to have really important impacts in terms of accountability on the ground and whatnot. Okay. So perhaps just then, in a, to wrap up in a final minute or so, can you talk a bit about where things are at now and what some opportunities for engagement might be for people who want to get involved? Sure. So really, on the uh, on the engagement side, um, you know we. One, one is sort of the why engage, I guess, and the important thing I think to keep in mind there is that the agenda coming forward or being proposed is supposed to be universal in nature. So whether your work is internationally focused or domestic focused, you're going, this is going to have implications. Um, so for, you know, domestic groups working on poverty in Canada, with what Canada is applying a universal framework, um, that includes provisions around poverty that that has some that will impact their work or has a, is a potential means um, to impact their work. So so from a domestic perspective as well as an international perspective, this universal agenda I think has implications for us all. Uh, also, I think given that it does have implications for us all, we might want to engage at the international level, certainly in defining those priorities. And I think what's important to keep in mind is that there are opportunities. Uh, to engage, you know, even the uh, the op the working group on sustainable development goals is open, um, and you know, uh, civil society organizations that have UN accredi accreditation are able to participate and go and uh, par uh, you know and, and feed into that process. You have the UN thematic consultations, which are happening. Uh, they're entering phase two, so phase one is essentially done. If you click that link, you can see the reports that came out, um, where it was really around kind of the priority issues. Phase two is much more the means of implementation, issues that didn't get addressed in phase one. And my understanding from Pete colleagues at uh, Foreign Affairs and Trade and Development is that um, they're in the process of doing sort of the, the concept notes and whatnot for that next phase. So, you know, it's something to keep an eye on. And then I, I've sort of listed some unofficial processes. So um, the Overseas Development Institute has a proposal tracker. We have our, which essentially just tracks 
different proposals that are out there. Uh, NSI has a tracking tool that lists the indicators and targets. And Stakeholder Forum is using um, crowdsourcing, <laughs> where people can go online and they can you know, inject their ideas for priorities uh, going forward. And so um, just to say that even through these means, these actors are also engaging in this process and are, are collecting ideas about priorities going forward. On the Canada side, very quickly, you have um, Foreign Affairs, Trade, and Development. Um, has in, I, I, my understanding is that there will there is a plan to consult with civil society organizations. I haven't received more details than that, so I won't say anything more. But my understanding is that we should expect that at some point, although it certainly hasn't been officially announced. Um, on the UN Association of Canada side, they are also doing consultations. That link takes you to their website, um, and they're doing consultations across Canada on Canadians' uh, priorities for post-2015, particularly in areas related to food security and agriculture. And finally, the Canadian Council for International Cooperation um, has actually just received word that they are going to be the, working with the Beyond 2015 campaign, that they are going to be the hub in Canada uh, to consult with civil society organizations and others on post-2015 issues. Um, so, so they're very much linked into that international process, um, but they're, they're, they're going to be available to uh, consult uh, and collaborate with civil society organizations in Canada to bring that, that perspective uh, to the international field. Okay. So I will stop there and um, happy That's to answer any questions. Tremendous. Thank you very much, Shannon. And those links in the uh, in your slide there should be clickable for people on their computers if they want to follow those uh, for more information. But thanks uh, for a tremendous summary in a very short period of time of an extremely complex <laughs> uh, process. So that's terrific. Um, there's a, a few comments there uh, in the, the chat room in the uh, chat box that we will um, get back to. Perhaps guest three, if you know any more information about the consultation in Ottawa, who organized that, uh, we might be able to better answer that uh, that question. But um, <clears throat> for now, let's move on to Danielle, who's been waiting patiently. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Danielle Tichel. Well, Danielle, Hello, Michael. Uh, Hello. Hello. Danielle is uh, Operations Manager of RIPES, the Intercontinental Network for the Promotion of the Social Solidarity Economy. And he uh, represents has represented uh, RIPES at the UN Non-Governmental Liaison Service consultations on advancing regional recommendations for the post-2015 development agenda last fall. That's the photo, I think, might be from, from that consultation. He was previously Executive Sec Secretary of the Brazil Solidarity Economy Forum and is joining us today from Brazil, a test of our technology. So thank you very much for joining us, Daniel. Uh, hello. Hello, everybody. Uh, can you hear me well? I, I know there were some problems with the sound. Is it okay? All right. Um, so I'm, uh, one, one more thing about me. Uh, it was uh, my fault. I didn't send. <laughs> I didn't send it to Michael before. I'm also a member of a cooperative here in Brazil, which works uh, developing uh, information technologies uh, to support um, the, uh, the struggles of social movements here in Brazil. All right. Um, so. Uh, I'd like to make a presentation. I was I was not patiently waiting. <laughs> On the contrary, I was eagerly <laughs> hearing uh, the presentation of uh, from Shannon. Uh, thank you, Shannon, for, for such a good uh, presentation. Um, well, uh, what I wanted to present is a little bit about the actual context of the world and social solidarity economy. A little bit about the UN general context now, not not in such detail. Uh, but more in, with a critically political view of what's going on, and some of the initiatives related to social solidarity economy in the UN, and uh, how RIPES is trying to influence uh, the post-2015 sustain, sustainable development goals construction, uh, well, if we get some influence. <laughs> well, about the actual context, it's just a brief, uh, uh, a brief, uh, overview uh, is that um, it's clearer than ever after we have a very consistent picture of an overall crisis uh, of different areas 
be they uh, the environment, be they uh, the social inclusion, be they uh, the happiness of the people, in, including in the development countries, be they in the processes of wars going on and, and never stopped, like bleeding that never stops. Uh, we can feel that, uh, and this feeling is, is more and more general, that we are uh, living uh, a systemic crisis, which is expressed by a number of crises, which somehow show us as humanity that we have done uh, very beautiful steps, but also uh, very terrible steps. And uh, the underlying of our civilization is what is bringing us our problems that we have. So we cannot anymore say that uh, the underdeveloped countries should strive to become developed countries because the developed countries are also lost about what they are doing and the planet is at risk. So this general context comes together uh, with the multiplication of initiatives, uh, in, uh, of the building of alternatives, uh, not only in social solidarity economy, but also in um, sub-areas uh, or, or like uh, the fair trade or agroecology, uh, 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 rural farming, uh, the, the small farmers, uh, relationship, direct relationship with consumers, complementary currencies, so many things going on. Um, but the difference is that now with this systemic crisis, somehow social solidarity economy is beginning to be looked at, not only as something direct to the poor, but also as something that could point to possibilities of trying to build up another framework of development. And that's this, this context I'd like to put so that we can come to the context of the UN, which is the center of our discussion now. Uh, I'd like to complement um, the presentation, the Shannon's presentation, with a political and critical view of what's going on in the UN. Uh, we have never before had uh, such a big influence of cooperation on the process of the UN. UN has some money problems, funding problems. Uh, sorry, ah, is it too? Can you hear me now? I'm trying to yeah, speak so I loud. Think it's, it's not bad if you can, uh, yeah, just uh, yes. keep speaking close to the phone. I, hopefully that'll be helpful. Yeah, I'm very, very close to the phone okay. now. Let me try to put my mic. Hello, hello. Uh, but then it goes down. Uh, Skype uh, makes it uh, automatically. Sure. Sorry, sure. Michael. Uh, my phone was was no problem. Was Keep far going. away. Okay. So, um, well, uh, this corporate influence is quite high. I will not explain it here. I will just leave it as a first uh, link for you. Um, this is uh, a, a report of how the corporate corporations are influencing the post-2015 agenda, and this is quite, quite, quite big. There are consultations taking place, but the main inputs are coming uh, from uh, 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 some spaces which are quite dominated by uh, neoliberal vision of what the society should be. So instead of trying to tackle the crisis we are living by paradigmatically changing the way we are doing economy, uh, some actors are trying to use this situation to try to expand the power of, of cooperation, both legally and also economically, uh, around the world, and try to put this as an answer to the problem. It's like giving sugar to a diabetic person. Um, so uh, this is some just as a second point, and then the, the last point I'd like to put that this is going to be the, my biggest uh, part of my presentation. Uh, what's going on with you in the UN related to the social solidarity economy, and how is RIPES trying to influence uh, the post-2015 agenda? This is not an easy task. Uh, I saw that Miguel was saying. He, he was saying, I would like to see how the UN can promote social solidarity economy in the government. The problem is the contrary. We must try to have more and more governments 
um, talking about social solidarity economy in the discussion about the sustainable development goals so that the UN can have it as resolution uh, in next year. So some things are happening and we are trying to have joint efforts there. Uh, the first one, uh, there is the ILO Academy on Social Solidarity Economy. This is my second input uh, as a link, uh, which is going on since uh, 2011. And we are going to have the fourth academy uh, this year, 2014, in July. And the theme is going to be inclusive and sustainable development uh, in July 2014 in, in, in Brazil, Campinas. Uh, this academy is interesting. We have a document here, which is my third input, which is interesting, uh, which says a little bit the contributions we have from uh, social solidarity economy to the concept itself of decent work. How can we talk about uh, associative work or work where the workers are the owners of what they are doing in the economy? Uh, the, how can this contribute to the concept of decent work, because the problem is that normally the ILO debates, uh, they, put, they only talk about uh, owners and subordinate employees, and they don't talk about the associative uh, work as a path uh, to think about decent work. Uh, we had also the Real Plus 20, which was uh, one of the biggest failures uh, that we had in uh, one uh, how can I say, there was a tentative to dominate the agenda of the environment, to find the environment as a new expansion area for uh, corporate and private sector speculation uh, of, uh, of the um, commodities, trying to create a commoditization of nature, which was called in a broad way as green economy. So uh, during the Real Plus 20, even the big uh, social uh, civil, civil society organizations, which were in the official meeting, uh, many of them got off the meeting and went to the People's Summit uh, because they were so frustrated about the, such a high corporate agenda on tackling the problems of the global warming uh, that they had to step off. Uh, and then in the People's Summit, we had uh, several declarations and a very strong participation of social solidarity economy uh, in relationship mainly with the women movement, with the food sovereignty movement, and uh, also the discussion about uh, agrarian reform and access to, to land uh, debates. And there was a declaration from Ripes uh, talking about the um, Real Plus 20 agenda, mainly about the green economy that you can read. This is uh, the fourth input. I just uh, put it uh, here for you. Uh, another thing that happened related to the UN process was uh, that the United Nations uh, Research Institute for Sustainable Development, called UNRIS, uh, organized on, on 2013, 2013, uh, a, a conference on potentials and limits of social solidarity economy. This was a very interesting activity, although it was much uh, intellectually oriented. Here are some of these results and videos if you want to check. Uh, it was interesting because it gave some visibility, and thanks to the lead of UNRIS and also other agencies in the UN, uh, these started the process of discussion inside, inside, inside the EUN agencies, uh, the discussion on the creation of uh, an interagency task force for um, the promotion of social solidarity economy. So um, this was going on parallel and uh, it was very, uh, it got uh, reinforced by this UNRIS conference. Another thing that happened just after this was a process led by a very tiny and small agency of the UN, which is the United Nations Non-Governmental Liaison Service, which should be the agency which is uh, somehow um, has the responsibility 
to make the dialogue between the United Nations and civil society. This small agency, and let me state that it's a very small agency because no corporate sector wants to fund it, so it's only funded by one or two governments, so that's why it does not have any funds, uh, made by itself uh, a global consultation which became a very good uh, document. If we compare these documents to the four high-level reports which Shannon uh, uh, told us, which were delivered to the, to the Executive Secretary, Ban Ki-moon, if we compare this report to the other five, four reports, we see that this one is much more progressive in trying to ensure uh, a binding between human rights framework and the development uh, uh, framework. So it's nice if you could check it, and we have a very strong uh, highlight of, uh, of social solidarity economy inside this. And this was uh, the basis of the biggest activity that the United Nations made with the civil society ever. So they had something like 1,200 civil society organizations present in the moment where this report was presented. Um, and, and social solidarity economy was quite present in this report. Uh, there is also, uh, as I said, after these uh, two moments of visibility, uh, the conference of, from UNRIS and this report from the UN NGLS, uh, the, it was consolidated the creation of the United Nations Task Force on Social Solidarity Economy. So some information here. If you want to check, um, it has now something like uh, 15 to 20 agencies of the UN taking part of it. It's very marginalized yet, but uh, we see much uh, potential for this uh, task force, inter-agency inter task force. Maybe this will be the way we will try to visibilize our struggle to have somehow social solidarity economy included uh, in the framework of the sustainable development goals for the post-2015 agenda. Um, as Shannon said, the UN SDSN, Sustainable Development Solutions Network, is finishing right now uh, an international uh, consultation, public consultation on the Sustainable Development Indicators Report, and we has made some contributions there uh, because the indicators they are presented are quite... Um, ah, yes, Maria Delight, thank you very much. This, info, this, this link is much better. Um, and... Uh, we had some contributions. We had the feeling that, unfortunately, the repairs, oh, sorry, the sustainable development indicators that the SDSN is putting forth, which is a great initiative, are unfortunately very conservative. Uh, for example, they only measure that poverty should be uh, human beings having less than $1.25 a day. This does not mean anything. If you look at the difference between rural and urban, if you look at the difference between Japan and Brazil, if you look at uh, how uh, the, the effectiveness, effectiveness of having your rights guaranteed have nothing to do with you being a consumer. Consumer is part of the, the game, but we don't want citizenship to be com confused with consumers. So this is uh, lots of problems we are having uh, by the way they are building up the indicators. Uh, uh, when they talk about the food, sober, uh, food uh, guarantee, they talk about uh, protein quantity in human beings. This has nothing to do. We are having problems in the United States because of industrial terrible proteins that we are having, which are not guaranteeing food sovereignty, which are not gu guaranteeing healthy people. They are only guaranteeing fat people that have pro proteins, but bad proteins. So we have problems of quality. Uh, also measurements about education, also problems there. What kind of education? They talk about indicators for education towards preparing people to be employees for big corporations and enterprises. That's not what we consider education. We want people becoming people that are active, being educated 
on, th- on culture, on philosophy, on thinking about nature, on about realization of human beings and not being prepared to be workers for enterprises. So we had problems looking at these uh, indicators and we made some contributions there. And to finalize, uh, we have this uh, RIPES global consultation which is going on. Uh, it might go on if you want to contribute. Uh, it's this last uh, last input there, uh, where we have a set of recommendations from the social solidarity economy to the post-2015 uh, development agenda. And what I'd like to 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 say is just some some points. I'm not going to detail it. I I, I suggest that you read it. This is the last link I'm going to publish here in this chat. <laughs> um, uh, I suggest you to read it, but I'd like to highlight some things. Uh, one thing that I would like to highlight is that social solidarity economy should not uh, try to think in a sectorial way like we have in common cooperativism. Cooperativism is part of social solidarity of economy, of course, but social solidarity economy is more a framework of development than simply a sector. So we cannot have the sectorial approach to try to, to influence the agenda. It means it's not important for us to have the citation of social solidarity economy in the development goals. What we need is that the underlying framework of how development is thought is based on equality, is based on uh, justice, is based on environment protection, is based on the preservation of the commons, is based on the liberty of going around the countries, etc., etc., etc. So uh, that's why the recommendations from RIPES that we are proposing as social solidarity economy recommendations for the post-2015 agenda are quite broad. So we have uh, four sectors. The first sector is about indicators, the, which is the underlying um, basis which made us contribute to the SDS in uh, 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 public consultation. Then we have a second sector, which is the transitioning to a fair social and solidarity economy, where we talk about recognizing social solidarity economy as other types of motors for other kinds of development. We don't have only the private sector as motor of development. We can have non-for-profit but economic activities, and these can promote development without having profit as its final uh, goal. So this recognition of social solidarity economy as motors of another development means the need of creating public policies environment so that we can have access to credit, access to financing, access to market, etc., for social solidarity economy initiatives around the world. Another um, point uh, highlight in the transitioning to a fair social solidarity economy sector of the of the document is the recognition of the commons, which cannot be commodi- commodified. Life cannot be commodified. Life cannot be put under the market uh, 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 gains of speculation. The other is the reform of the finance system. The other is to review the trade agreements, which are killing the autonomy of the states to respond to their own people because they have these fair trade agreements, like we had now in, in India, which is a crazy thing. I don't know if you know. Uh, in India, they try to implement the same thing we have here in Brazil, which is uh, the state can buy food from the local farmers in the municipalities to provide this food for hospitals and schools. And then the corporations, they, came, they went to the World Trade Organization to sue the Indian government because this is an action from the Indian government which goes against the free concurrency of the poor little corporations because they want to, to sell Nestle products to poor people. So we have this fair trade agreement with buy, which binds the government, and the government cannot have the autonomy to respond to people's priorities and needs and get uh, subdued to corporate uh, a, 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 a profit uh, seeds. Okay, and, and yeah. 
I'm finishing. I, I'm finishing. Okay. The last, uh, the last part is to submit uh, is to adopt a human rights-based approach to development. I already talked about it, and about participation and transparency. So that's a little bit about our initiative. We are members of the UN Task Force on Social Solidarity Economy, and we are trying there the next uh, meeting we ha we're going to have on April 3rd. We are trying to debate how can we have a common and joint effort to influence on the post-2015 agenda, uh, be it from the UN side, be it from the state side, be it from the civil society side. That's it. Sorry, Michael, for Super. taking no, the time. No, I'm, I'm fine. You have a lot to say, and so I appreciate that. I'm sorry to have to cut you off, but I just wanted to leave a bit of time for the uh, conversation and uh, discussions in the chat room. Um, uh, we'll move to the question and answer period there for the little less than 10 minutes or so of time that that's left. Um, and people should feel free to post additional questions or comments in the chat box. We have one from Miguel there uh, that I'll get to. But before that, I just wanted to ask a broader question because Philippe had posted earlier that uh, one of the big changes from the Millennium Development Goals to the Sustainable Development Goals is that the northern countries will now have to contribute to goals and targets uh, and achievements. And as you had said, uh, Danielle, that the, the issue is not so much how we get the UN to promote the social and solidarity economy uh, to member states, but we have to get member states promoting the social and solidarity economy within the UN. So. Now that raises the question, especially for, for us here in Canada, is what we can do to be influencing uh, the, the federal government here, the Canadian government, to be promoting the social and solidarity economy at the United Nations. And there was one question about planned engagement events um, coming up or a session being done uh, in Ottawa last September. Uh, uh, I was wondering, um, <clears throat> Shannon, you'd said that a plan is coming from foreign affairs. Do you think that would likely include public consultation?